What exactly is the Gothic language? Gothic is the language of the earliest literary documents of the Germanic peoples as a whole, emphasis here on literary. The linguistic remnants of the Germanic peoples which antedate Gothic remains are some runic inscriptions written in the alphabet known as the Elder Futhark, and um, it designates or it transcribes the Proto-Germanic uh, language as an ancestor of all other Germanic languages. The Gothic language uh, definitely shared some characteristics with it because of its general linguistic conservatism. So it's pretty close to the uh, Proto-Germanic language um, or languages. The language itself belongs to what is termed East Germanic. Um, it is the sole documented survivor of the branch. Other languages presumed to have belonged to the group, for example, Vandalic, left no written records. The primary source of linguistic data for the Gothic language is what remains of a translation of the Bible made sometime in the 4th century by Bishop Ulfilas. Gothic may have survived near the Black Sea, although in altered form, until, let's say, the 16th century as a non-literary language now termed Crimean Gothic. It's quite difficult to uh, know for sure the location of the Gothic homeland because the Goths, first of all, uh, left no clear archaeological records which might be used to pinpoint their exact location, and they don't seem to have remained in one region for a long period of time, being driven to migration for, uh, by both internal and external factors. From later sources, there is somehow of a general consensus that the earliest known location of the Goths was somewhere in northern or northeastern Europe. Um, this might have included parts of Scandinavia as well as the northern regions of modern Poland. Goths appear to have migrated afterwards to the region bordering the Black Sea to the north and to the east of the Danube River, which formed the border of the Roman Empire. From this region, the Goths ventured out in the mid-3rd century on a series of raids which marked the beginning of a centuries-long battle between the Gothic and Roman, the Goths and the Roman Empire, or if not um, battle, at least a very tense relationship. The Goths crossed the Danube River into the Roman territory in 376 AD, fighting a battle at Ad Adrianople where Emperor Valens dies. At no point in um, the history books do the Goths seem to have been a completely unified people. When they engage in the earliest raids, they seem to have been broken into several factions. By the time they became a true threat to the empire, they seem to have somehow unified in two main groups, eventually termed the Visigoths and Ostrogoths. However, earlier we have terms such as uh, the Thervingi and Greuthungi, mentioned, for example, by Amianus Marcellinus or Historia Augusta. Um, then we also have Jordanus, the uh, Gothic historian, mentioning a very improbable single Gothic empire. The term Visigoth may have originated in um, some embellished name, but it soon came to denote the West, and its counterpart, Ostrogoth, seems to have connoted the East. So both terms agree with some kind of relative location of the tribes. The latter, the latter tribe eventually fought alongside the Huns and the ravaged Europe. The former pushed its way through Italy and seized, um, or at least sacked, to Rome itself. The subsequent migrations and settlements also left some linguistic remnants in the regional names uh, throughout Europe. Now let's talk a little bit about what makes the Gothic language so special. It has some characteristics which distinguish it from other languages of the Germanic family. So, for example, we have a Proto-Germanic vowel a, most probably, um, which became a Gothic a, but in other languages it became o. Then we have the double consonant g, which is also always found before uh, before a schwa, before a w, and the, these are reflexes of a general sound development called sharpening. Uh, according to this rule, Proto-Germanic uh, double schwa became Gothic double G schwa. A similar development changed the Proto-Germanic uh, double E to Gothic double D E. So, for example, you have something similar in Old Norse. Um, if you think of the of a word such as trügger, like spelled with uh, double G. Gothic does not show the effects of rhoticism, which other Germanic languages display. 
Through this change, a Proto-Germanic Z became an R in most of the Germanic daughter languages. Just think of the verb to learn and compare it with the verb in Gothic. Gothic displays the chain, change of an initial Proto-Germanic FL to a Thorn L, so the th sound, which does not seem to occur in other Germanic languages. Um, this seems to have happened in the environment of sounds such as H or Q. So in um, Old Norse, for example, you would have something like Flya, so with FL, but uh, the same word in Gothic would be with uh, ThL. Gothic did not undergo the umlaut changes, the e umlaut or o umlaut, found in several other Germanic languages. Through this change, an e contained in one syllable would serve to front the vowel of the immediately preceding syllable, leaving its roundness unaffected. So compare, for example, uh, hond as in hand in Old Norse with its uh, counterpart in Gothic, where we do not have this rounding um, of, the, um, uh, of the vowel. We don't have the umlaut. Gothic has retained the original nominative singular masculine ending preserved uh, from a group of nouns in old, in Proto-Germanic, uh, ending in AZ. For example, um, where you have in Old Norse and um, in other languages an, an R or nothing, such as Dagger, you will have in Gothic uh, an ending S. Germanic languages generally use vocalic alteration to signal a change in tense. That would also be important. Just think of those endless lists of verbs you had to learn if you studied either English or German or any other Germanic language, um, where you have the past, the simple past tense or preterit with a lot of vowel changes. Um, that you had to study by heart, probably, although there are um, there are samples so changes, patterns um, occurring with the sound change. Gothic possesses, in addition to these vowel changes, the possibility to reduplicate the root syllable to mark the past, uh, the past tense. So if you look at a verb such as to be called, uh, hetan, you can um, form the preterit by doubling the root, as you can see here. And speaking of this verb, Gothic also had the morphological passive. So, for example, if you have perada, which is uh, to be born, um, the passive conjugation is noticeable. It was only found in the present tense. Um, it is comparable to other languages such as Greek and Sanskrit. Um, there are some very few remnants in other languages. Just think of the verb heißen in German, or that would be Haiti in Old Norse, which actually means to be called. So it is a form of passive. All right, other um, features are, for example, the fact that Gothing and Old Norse share a feminine participle formation in EN um, rather than in uh, EO formation found in West Germanic. Um, such features have determined some scholars to say that Gothic and Old Norse formed a single branch of Germanic, which divided afterwards. Um, this would also have the benef benefit of the geographical support because, like I said before, ancient sources described the earliest location of the Goths in the vicinity of Scandinavia. However, um, Gothic shares some features with Old High German, so that would be the West Germanic branch to the exclusion of Old Norse. So, for example, you have the third person pronoun, masculine nominative singular stem in E rather than H. Um, so think of he in, um, um, in English, um, but um, in um, Old Norse that would be uh, him, so with, with E afterwards. Then we have the third person singular present indicative of the verb to be, the most important verb, with a final uh, T. So East, that would be common for both Gothic and Old High German, and in Old Norse you actually have uh, R. Let's talk a little bit about the very bizarre alphabet. The Gothic alphabet was invented in the 4th century by the bishop who wrote the Bible, Ulfilas. Um, to record the Gothic language, um, 
It consisted of 27 letters, most of them were derived from Greek Uncial script, with several letters modified from Latin or borrowed from runic uh, scripts, although they could have also developed them uh, separately. Um, the corpus of the Gothic language now consists chiefly of large portions of a translation of the New Testament Gospels and the Epistles, the only surviving remnants of the Old Testaments are chapters 5 to 7 of Nehemiah. This translation is ascribed to this bishop, Ulfila, in the middle of the 4th century, although there is no direct evidence that the translation that survives is actually the one he made. Some other people might have contributed as well. Um, this translation is apparently based on the, on the Antiochian Byzantine recension of Lucian the Martyr, which was a Greek text dominant in the Diocese of Constantinople. Of the codices that contain the Gothic translation of the Bible, the most important one would be the Codex Argenteus, so that would be the Silver Codex, by far the most impressive. Um, the name comes from the binding, which is made of silver, um, there are 187 leaves out of a presumed original of 336. The pages are of purple parchment, now a faded red with letters of silver and gold. So the beginnings of the Gospels, for example, uh, the Gospel symbols at the bottom of the pages are written in gold letters. The rest is written in silver. The Codex was discovered in the Abbey of Verden in the 16th century, and now you can find it in the library of the University of Uppsala. Then we have the Codex uh, Gisensis, found in Egypt in 1907. There were actually four pages subsequently ruined by water damage. We also have Codex Carolinus, that's palimpsest with four leaves, now residing in the library of Wolfenbüttel. Um, and then you also have the Codices Ambrosiani, likewise palimpsests. There are five of these codice, codices. Um, A, for example, contains 102 leaves um, with various segments of the epistles, as well as one page of a calendar. B contains 78 leaves with the complete texts of the uh, Corinthians, as well as parts of the other epistles and so on and so forth. Interestingly, in the last one, we have a document which is called Explanation of the Gospel according to John. Um, the author of this commentary is not known, but we might speculate that Ulfilas wrote this, although we don't really have any direct evidence for this. In addition to uh, what I mentioned before, there are some remnants of other documents, but not as important by far. So, for example, a fragment of a calendar of martyrs, um, some marginal notes in a Veronese manuscript, um, a Latin title deed from Ravenna, um, something like that. So, also examples of the letters of the Gothic alphabet written with, the, with their associate um, names. A few phrases remain in um, an almost phonetic Latin trans, uh, transcription as well. And we also have a letter by the diplomat uh, Ghislain de Busbeck, um, which is believed to contain the most recent traces of the Gothic language. It describes his encounter in the 16th century with two envoys from Crimea who spoke a language presumed to be something like Gothic, something related to it. This letter was then published in Paris, but the identification is pretty hard because um, we have separate words and um, there are many problems of orthography and transmission. All right, so now I'm going to try to recite to you the Gothic Lord's Prayer um, so that you can have a feeling of what the language might have sounded like. or It's, it's a very approximate um, pronunciation either way. So, Ota unsar tu in himinam, wichne namo thin, quime thiudinassus thins, werthe vilia thins, suein himina jah ana erthe, hlef unsarana thana sintinan, gif uns hima daha, jah afflet uns tatis kulan sia, suasweja wis afflet am, tem skulam unsaram, 
Jag ni pringes uns i frästubnie, att lås i uns av tamma ovillin. Und sina i sjudan gardi, jag macht, jag hulthus i ewis. Amen. All right, hope you enjoyed this and found out some interesting things about the Gothic language. This was Irina. Thank you so much for following my channel and listening to my talks. See you next time.